Uh, the next thing you think need for good narration is good uh, is a uh, varied sentence structure. There are two examples uh, that we've got here that we'll go over. Uh, but basically, varied sentence structure is using using commas and semicolons correctly, and not writing in independent clauses. Da 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 da. Period. Da 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 da. -da period. Uh, we talked about that at the beginning. That's, that's why it's necessary to be able to use varied sentence structure to, to uh, express complex thoughts through compound sentences, and it also allows a rhythm and a flow to your uh, uh, to your to your language, uh, as I read it or as any reader reads it. So, if you look at the original here, the store manager went to the walk-in refrigerator every day. Period. The heavy metal door clanged shut behind her. Period. I had visions of her freezing to death among the hanging carcasses. Period. The shiny door finally swung open. Period. She waddled out, right? So that's that's that not not not, not really jerky. So if you revise it, you have each time the store manager went to the walk-in refrigerator, the heavy metal door clanged shut behind her. Visions of her freezing to death among the hanging carcasses crept into my mind until the sh uh, shiny door finally swung open and she waddled out. And you're taking four or five sentences here and combining them, uh, varying the sentence structure using commas, and you've really got two sentences, and it reads much smoother. The next one, the yellow and blue striped fish struggled on the line. Its scales shimmered in the sunlight. Its tail waved frantically. I saw its desire to live. I decided to let it go. Four sentences, verses two. Scales shimmering in the sunlight, tail waving frantically. The yellow and blue striped fish struggled on its line, on the line, excuse me. Seeing its desire to live, I let it go. Much more fluid, using commas to do this. Now, because what happens when you don't use commas, you always have to have your subject in each sentence, right? You have to have subject and you have to verb. Subject and a verb to have a sentence. So here, the yellow and blue striped fish struggled on the line. Okay. The fish struggled, right? That's your sentence. So here, whose scales? The fish's scales, right? But so you're gonna use a pronoun, say it. It is a subject. It scales, uh, it scales shivered, right? Okay, you have another period. Then you have another sentence. When you have another sentence, you have to have another subject. Well, the subject is the same as the sentence before, so what are you going to use again? It, again. Another sentence. Whose desire? No, I saw whose desire. The fish's desire. Again, another it. Decided to let what go? Which is what? It. So, in this sentence, you have it, 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 it. You have four it's, right? And, all, and it is the exact same thing, which is the fish. So, whenever you use these simple sentences like this, in each sentence you have to have a subject. If you're talking about the same subject four sentences in a row, you have to establish that it's either you either use that person's name or you use a noun or a pronoun. You know, so if I'm talking about Janet, I would have to say Janet, uh, she, or her, just depending on what, how my sentence is structured. In this case, I'm talking about the fish. So I can either say fish every sentence or I can say it every sentence. But when you're talking about a fish or it, sentence after sentence after sentence, you have this repetitive subject that takes place, which is either going to be a noun or a pronoun. And when you do that, it becomes tedious, and it becomes very, very jerky. Versus in this place, in this sentence, you have uh, fish here once, and then you have pronoun referring back to uh, it, pronoun, pronoun it referring back to the fish, which is the subject, repeated twice here. Seeing its desire to live, or uh, seeing its desire to live, I let it go. Right? So you're cut down the number of pronouns that you use, which then makes it more fluid. This last section here, which says the boss yelled at him. Um, if you would use this, the boss yelled at him, which is an active verb, instead of he was yelled at by the boss, which is a passive verb. You want to use active verbs because, again, they imply action versus passivity. Passivity means you're kind of standing back. You're not as engaged in it. Okay, so uh, also try to replace anemic to be verbs. Uh, a to be verb is what? Is means to be. Um, past tense of that is was. So she was a good basketball player. That is to be. With a more dynamic construction, and like she played basketball well. She was a good basketball player. She played basketball well. Played means that you that you know you're engaged. The action is engaged in the sentence versus more passive to be. Here, um, you keep your point of view and the verb tense consistent. And this is a big one. You always want to keep the same narrator point of view, and you always want to keep your verb tense consistent. If you're telling a story that takes place in the past, 
unless you have a flash forward or you, you break to present time, you always use past tense verbs. Students do this all the time. They mess up their, they mess up their verb tenses, which then like, you know, like I actually pay attention to what you read. And hopefully in the, like, in the real world, if you're writing stuff to your boss or to a colleague or what, you know, whatever, you want people to pay attention to what you, what you read, what they read of you. So, you know, if you're mixing up your verb tenses, that's very confusing. It's like, I thought she, I thought she was saying this happened yesterday. Why is she acting like it's happening today, right? Past tense versus present tense. Keep your tense present, and then never shift your narrator point of view. And in this class, you'll be writing for this essay. You'll be writing a first person point of view. Whenever you move on to, uh, whenever you move on to thirteen o two, you only write in third person point of view. You never write I, me, us, our, none of that stuff. Right, because you are supposed to be removed and, and writing critically and analytically. Whenever you do that, you often write as a third person point of view to remove yourself as the narrator to remove first person bias. So, if you're writing an essay for 1302 and then you write I, me, our, you've just broken the, the basic law of writing a critical analysis essay over literature by inserting yourself into the situation, which is what you don't do. If you have a research paper and you write I think that this happens in a research paper, you've got to let it grade off because that's no longer a research paper. Research papers are not written in first point of for first person point of view. So whenever you do that, you've changed the topic of your research paper. Right? It's like going to, and like, I don't know, you're gonna you know, originated originally we're gonna make a pineapple upside down cake and then you end up making a chocolate cake and you give it to a person like well, I wanted I don't know who would want like pineapple upside down cake over chocolate cake, but just follow me there. So anyways, you get someone a different cake, like, well this isn't what I want. Like, yeah, I know, but you know, I switched it along the way. It doesn't matter, that's not what I wanted. Um, if you look at, we'll go back to this one in a second. I want to go over the 4th of July. Because this is a very simple story. It starts on page 160. Whenever we talk about identifying conflict in a story, one of the most important things that you need to... Um, begin to figure out about telling a story is that there are, even though there is a, you know, you have to have a single conflict, most of the time it needs to be that, a, that an external conflict leads to an internal conflict. And that internal conflict leads to a change in the protagonist or maybe both characters in the story. If you look at something like action movies, for example, like, you know, like action movies, like, like action movies don't win Academy Awards, you know. Why? Why don't uh, action movies win Academy Awards? Yeah, like, 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 because an action movie is about being entertained and having your heart rate like jack through the roof most of the time. Is he gonna die? Who's gonna kill? Right? You want to see like hundreds of people's, you know, heads get shot off and necks broken, and you know, just want to see like ass kicking for an hour and a half, and then like, yeah, that was awesome, and then leave, right? Well, you're not supposed to cry really during an action movie or anything like that. But the difference between good action movies and bad action movies goes down to a very simple premise most of the time. And very rarely does it have anything to do with acting. Although acting, like, obviously, like, if someone's a really bad actor, it doesn't matter what they're doing. Like, it's just it's hard to watch. But let's say that all, all levels of acting are equal across all action movies. It has to do with conflict. Now, with action movies, you have the obvious conflict of, like, you know, I'm going to beat up this dude. Then I'm going to go beat up this dude. Then I'm going to go break this dude's leg. And it goes on and on and on. Those are like minor conflicts that don't really matter. So much so that those minor conflicts aren't even conflicts in the first place. It's just an excuse for you to see like somebody flipping in the air, shooting guns a cool way or something. The real conflict um, for a good action movie always has to be like the inter internal conflict. If you look at um, uh, like the Taken movie, like that was not supposed to be as big of a movie as it really was. It was like kind of a B-level movie. Uh, how many of you guys have seen Taken? Most people have seen Taken? Yeah, okay. This is like a regular, I still have to stuff all the time. Okay, so Taken, obviously, on the, at the surface, it's about Liam Neeson's daughter being kidnapped and then him, like, just wrecking all of Eastern Europe, right? But, or Western Europe, they're in France. But, at the, at, but that's not the heart of the movie, that's not what it is, right? Liam Neeson's internal conflict in that movie is, is as a father. Because his daughter, he, he sacrificed his daughter, he sacrificed his marriage, and he sacrificed his daughter's childhood and service of the country. It's not like he was like roaming around the world like, you know, hooking up with hookers and getting drunk. Like he was serving in horrible parts of the, of the world, doing unspeakable things and, you know, to serve the country, to protect America, whatever. He's a hero. And he sacrificed his family and his daughter's childhood for that. 
And so now he comes back into her life. He's done with that life. He served his duty. He's filled that he's he feels that he's fulfilled his patriotic duty. He comes back, and now his daughter is she's like a young lady now. She's like a young woman, and she is no longer wanting training wheels. She wants to be able to ride or walk on her own. And so him, he's having to struggle with the fact that he has missed he has missed out on her childhood, and it's not fair to put her back in the role of an absolute child that she is developing into her own woman. And so because of that. She wants to go to France, and she's not even like, I think she's, she's still in high school, isn't she? Yeah, she's still in high school and wants to go to France like a friend, go out and play by themselves. Problem is, look, one, like, her, the mom in that movie is just a bad mom. Because, um, like, you don't let your kids do that when they're still in high school, especially if you got a guy like Liam Neeson, like, that's been over there, like, like that's, that's his conflict, right? Like, he goes, no, 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 like, I've killed a bunch of people over there. I know what goes on over there with unattended girls in Europe and sex trafficking and all that stuff. Like, I know. But he's not been a part of her life, but he is her father, but he's not been a part of her life, so is he really her father? To what extent is he her father? And he can or cannot say these things, right? And can or cannot exercise these judgment. So he exercises the judgment to let her be a young woman, even though it's against his better judgment, because he knows what can happen to her. And then she gets kidnapped, like within five minutes of being in France, right? And then he gets that phone call, that's where he makes the whole like, badass thing, like, I will find you, and I will kill you. And you're like, you know, when he does that speech, like the first time that you watch it, like you get all hair singing on the back, like, I wish that was my dad, you know? <laughs> be awesome. And so, uh, and so he goes, right? And, but the internal conflict is, one, the fact that he let her do this whenever, ultimately the decision was his. The mother said, like, you know, we're not going to do this without your decision. You know, you have to say yes, you have to sign these papers, or whatever. So um, he's struggling with that conflict and his role as a father. On top of that, you have the fact that these, like, you know, sex traffickers kidnaps his daughter, right? But the external conflict is the kidnapping of the daughter. Right, because that would never force that real conflict of, that he has inside. If they go to France, they just have a good time and they fly back. Right? There's a minor conflict, but not enough to engage you. But it's the moment that she becomes kidnapped that you see him revert to his older self and all of this stuff. And then you, you, but you have that, the, the internal conflict is what drives the heart of the movie. And if they didn't set up that relationship with his daughter, the awkwardness of his daughter at the beginning of the movie, you wouldn't really care. The exact, it's the exact same premise of um, like John Wick. Have you, how many of you have seen John Wick, the first John Wick movie? Most people have, okay? The movie's very simple. This, the, the premise for that is even more basic in some levels, but in others, it's a lot darker. Because you, in, in John Wick, Keanu Reeves is like this retired hitman, but he's not really a hitman, he's like the hitman. He's like, he's like a soul assassin. His like, gangster name or his hitman name is, is uh, I don't know what it is, a Russian, but it's, they call him the boogeyman. And so he has like this godlike status around his ability to kill and to just not stop. He is a killing machine. He is all that is darkness. And then he finds this woman uh, that is light, pure light for him, and that balances him out because he is all that is black and dark in the world. And so um, she tames the boogeyman, and in a very short period of time after they are wed, she has a cancer or something happens to her, she dies. And to replace her in his life because she knows that he needs balance and, and she strikes such a balance for him and she loves him, and she was able to calm the demons and the shadows inside of him. In turn, she gives him a puppy, right? And like, there's nothing, there's, there's not a more like beautiful source of light and goodness than a little puppy, right? Like, if you don't like little puppies, you're like, you're a bad, you're a sick person. Like, you have to like little puppies. It's just like ingrained in our DNA, in your biology. You must like little puppies. If you don't, you're a weirdo, right? So he has this little puppy. He cares for this little puppy. Feeds it a little milk out of saucer bowls and all this stuff. Like, oh, it's cute, you know. There's like this absolute savage that is uh, that is tamed by this cute, innocent little puppy. And then he encounters someone from his past that they don't really know him anyway. So they break into his house, they're gonna steal his car, and then they end up killing his his dog, which is like you no, know, like it's, that's a no-no for audiences too, right? Like I think I've said that before. Like you can kill a million people, you won't bat an eye, but you kill a dog and you're in serious trouble. Like with the audience and the main character, which is exactly what happens with John Wick. And so by the taking of his, the light, the last remaining glimpse of a, of a salvation that was robbed from him. So not only did, they, did he lose his wife, but not only did they kill his dog, right, which is, that is one, that is one, that's an external conflict that causes him to, like, just go wreck shop and murder everyone. But the real conflict inside is that, like, that dog was a source of, like, salvation and life. Because he had always struggled with his shadows, struggled with his, his demons. And he literally buries them. If you've seen the movie, he... He, like, he buries all of his guns and his gold that he has acquired from taking people's lives. And then he has, he gets a sledgehammer and he literally digs back up the past, this darkness that he has buried and put concrete over to never rise again. And then whenever these people rob him of 
his only chance at salvation, his only chance at love and hope and all of that stuff, they rob him from the light. He goes and he digs up his darkness and brings back that darkness. And all throughout the movie, there's like a line in the movie where he talks about people keep asking me if I'm back, if I'm back. And he's, yeah, I think I'm back. Meaning that, yeah, he's fully transformed and accepted his shadow self and is going to spread that darkness over anyone that lays in his path of vengeance. Okay? And that's like some gnarly stuff if you think about it like deep down, right? That's some dark, heavy stuff. But on the surface, it's like a cool, like, kicky, punchy, you know, action movie where you get to see some cool guns and kicks and jujitsu moves and stuff. But, but deeper than that, it goes deep. It really does, because there's thought behind the story process. So if you have just a simple action movie that has no other level to peel back, right? It's just all surface. Yeah. Okay. It's like a Transformers movie. Like, Transformers movies are famous for that. Like, you can go watch a Transformers movie and be like, that looks awesome. But they're two and a half hours long, and, like, they suck. They just keep on going, like, okay, I get it, like, more robots fighting each other and swords and dinosaur dragons and like because there's no real story. The stories don't make sense whatsoever. And that's why Transformer movies, they have all the visual spectacle and appeal. Michael Bay is so good at at the visuals that he even has ha, has picked out there are two colors that the, the human eye responds to the most. Uh, it is a particular type of orange and a particular type of purple. And if you see Michael Bay's movies, he does this not only in trans Transformer movies are are hardcore this, but he does this with the Ninja Turtle movies. He's done this with the uh, with the Bad Boys movies as well. He lights his movies in a particular way that you are immediately drawn to. It's a, a, like a screen or a shading. You're immediately drawn to the screen. You can't help but look. That's why you're always like Michael Bay movies. You're always looking at them. But it's like eating it's like junk food, right? You eat junk food, you feel it. It tastes good. It tastes good. It tastes good. It tastes good. And then 30 minutes later, why are you still hungry after you eat? Just low when there's no room in your stomach. To put any more food, why are you still hungry? Yeah, because there is no nourishment there. There is no sustenance to tell your body that, like, your body desires nutrients to feed itself, to for, like, to for fuel, right? But if you're putting in, un, if you're putting in just space that is no fuel, your body's like, no, I need nutrients to power this engine, and you're just cramming full of crap that will not let me power it. It's actually dragging me down. It's the same thing with the Michael Bay movie, or many other movies uh, that, that suffer from this. Like Zack Snyder that did the, the Batman Superman movie. Like his movies, historically, people have criticized him for that. If you watch a Zack Snyder movie, like you watch Batman versus Superman, it looks amazing. Like Superman looks great, Batman looks awesome, but the story is like, you know, it's just not there. So people are disappointed because it doesn't matter how awesome you make Batman or Superman look. If, the, if you don't get the roles right, there's another the problem with, with uh, Zack Snyder's Batman movie. Uh, Zack Snyder's Batman movie, Batman was like, had machine guns and missiles and was just nuking dudes and setting guys on fire and killing people left and right. And historically, like if, you know, anyone that, that knows anything about comic books and Batman, like Batman doesn't use guns and Batman definitely doesn't kill people to his like detriment all throughout the comics and like pop popular culture and, and Batman, he just doesn't kill. And so the movies that, uh, the Batman movies that Christopher Nolan did, right, that had, uh, who was, the, who was the Batman before Ben Affleck? What's his name? Christian Bale. Christian Bale. Yeah. That was like his big thing. And that's what they got right about those movies is that Christian Bale refused to kill under any and every, absolute every circumstance. He would not kill, would not kill. The second movie, the most famous Batman movie with Heath Ledger as the Joker, right? That was the one thing that the Joker was trying to get Batman to do was to choose who lives and who dies to bring him to, to, bring him to that level of darkness like the Joker. That's all the Joker really wanted right? was to break Batman's moral code. And so even though the Batman in like those Christopher Nolan movies, he didn't look anything like the Batman in the comic books. Like Zack Snyder got the look right. He got the effects right. He got everything right. It's a beautiful movie. But the story rolls are wrong. The conflict is wrong. And that at the end of the day is what everything revolves around in storytelling and, and uh, an external conflict leading to that internal conflict. If there is no internal conflict between a character, you don't care. It doesn't matter. Just like uh, we talked about like the Kardashians and they're like fake you know, they're, they're fake conflict that they have within the storytelling, right? Like, so what if Chloe steals Kim's shoes? Is there any type of internal conflict that could possibly arise from that? No. Not unless Kim, Chloe's been stealing Kim's shoes plus money from her bank account, plus her men, plus all this other dark stuff that really, like, would really instigate an, a, 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 an internal conflict. But again, obviously, that can't be solved in 20 minutes. So let's just leave it at, like, you know, Courtney steals Kim's shoes, and she over, you know, she over freaks out, and you know, unfollows her from Instagram or whatever those people do. So here you have a very simple story 
It is a young, it's a young girl, but a family, that is traveling to Washington, D.C. Um, on the 4th of July. Why is the, the in stories, the narratives, fiction, um, narratives, this isn't fiction, based on a true story, as, she, as the author recalls it, why are titles important? They help to inform you what the stories are about. Titles always help you to, help to inform what the stories are about. Now, if you're doing narrative, if you're telling a story, then the, the, that it needs to be it needs to be a witty title. It needs to be a smart title um, that that references the rest of the story. Now, if I was you know, I was going to talk about something like trade relations between China, Russia, North Korea, and the United States, the title of the essay would probably be "Trade Relations Between China, Russia, North Korea, and the United States." You know. It wouldn't be some witty, snappy title, because that's a different style, right? But for this, if you're telling a story, you need to have something that's relevant. The 4th of July is important to us for what reason? Independence Day. Independence Day. That's like, like America, right? That's whenever we put on our as much American flag and red, white, and blue and star stuff as we possibly can with our bandanas and like do donuts out in pastures and hammer beers and barbecue and just screaming eagles and all that stuff, right? We're hardcore America. So... During the 4th of July, that is America's day. That is the day that represents all, like, all that America stands for. So it's perfect that this, that this you know, set up because, again, she's examining the mythology of America, the mythology of 4th of July versus the reality of America and the reality of 4th of July. Because for her, it's this all-American like family that's traveling to Washington, D.C. to go visit the, mon the nation's monument. Washington, D.C. is like the heart of America, right? It is, that is where America, like we, that is where, they, like, that, that's the heart of America. So... They go and they're having a nice little um, day, and they go to get some ice cream, which again is like quintessential Americana, getting some Fourth of July ice cream in the heart of America. And you see this word start to pop up here. I've utilized through an agonizing Corolla of dazzling whiteness. And this is important. You see the word whiteness start to appear. They go and they get, they are refused service really for their uh, because of why? Why they refuse service? Because of skin color. Color of skin, which is also important because she doesn't like open the story up saying like we were a black family, right? That we're a family. Like that my family was doing this, and the color of their skin for for her is going to be like secondary, right? Of course. So, um, and then here she the word whiteness starts to come in, but it's not. My parents wouldn't speak of this injustice not because they attribute to it, because they felt they should not have anticipated and avoided it. That made, this made me even angrier. Okay, so this happens. And then this, the word starts popping up, pop up again. The waitress was white. The counter was white. The ice cream. I never ate Washington, D.C. I left my summer. That summer I left my childhood behind was white. The white heat, the white pavement, and then around it were white, uh, white monuments all around. So she leaves. Because of this encounter, she then leaves, and she notices the world around her is what color? White. It is a white world. It is a white person's world. Is she white? No. So does she belong? No. Well, I mean, like, I'll, in America, yes. I'll, yeah, I'm not, like, saying. <laughs> I'm recording this lecture, too. In the context of the story, what she, is, what she is saying is, like, I do not belong here. I am a black-skinned person in a white world. And everything that I see around me, people talk about this all the time about, you know, um, I mean, that's a big debate now. Like, if you look at the, uh, the issues of, like, the Confederate statues all throughout the South, funnily enough, we talk about those statues like they've been there forever. Do you guys know when they started erecting those Confederate statues? Yeah, about around the civil, the, the time for, uh, of civil rights and whenever people were fighting for racial equality, that's when they were they constructed those Confederate statues. It was not a matter of like preserving heritage or history. It was about rem reminding people of different colored color skin where they came from or who used to rule over them. Right? It, it was, they were not erected many, many, many years ago. They were erected relatively recently during the days of um, during the days of Jim Crow world laws as well as uh, pushing for, uh, for racial equality. As a side, I don't know why I said that. But anyway, um, but the the idea that this is uh, this is like a, the, that this person's skin is black versus a white world, right? And we talked about this. We all this stuff always ties in together, right? But you do not get more opposite, right, than black and white, right? There's no, there's like this this harsh contrast that she shows for us. And we always earlier we were talking about John Wick and the idea of of, of lightness and dark and, uh, and and black and white. That is, that is a dichotomy that is set up. All throughout literature, that is one of the things that makes America just discussing like American and American like um, 
just sociological issues. And you have, like, again, issues of white and black. The, the White House actually did this the other day. It was so funny. Like, and I hope that they didn't like really, really, really think this through. They were talking about the issues of the NFL and the protests, and they were talking. They were. I don't remember if they, if they were speaking on behalf of the White House or on behalf of of uh, uh, Donald Trump. But they said the, the speaker for the White House said, "Yeah, I mean, we think the issue is pretty black and white." And it's like <laughs> that's so like. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, but they obviously, you know, you wouldn't like, you know, that they're they don't mean black people and white people, but that's clearly like at the heart of it. That is what so much of the issue people feel is about. It was just an interesting choice of choice or, or misuse um, of words. Part of your childhood is marked by innocence, and you know, your childhood you can leave that innocence behind. It's like you to become an adult, you have to leave that innocence behind at some point because part of innocence of childhood is creating your own world, right? And seeing the world the way that you want to. Some people have imaginary friends. That's why they can take, like, you know, play with G.I. Joes and, like, Barbie dolls for hours and hours on end because you have that imagination. You have that innocence to allow yourself to suspend reality and, and, um, and your, like, your, your rooting of consciousness in this world. But part of becoming an adult is, is realizing that the world that you thought you knew or the world that you want to be true is not the real world. That's a part of an enlightenment. You know, your your environment, your world, you will you will have some level of enlightenment whether you want to or not. Because if you don't have any enlightenment, if you don't see the world for as it is all, you are detached from reality completely and you're crazy. Right? So even as a child going into adulthood, you are forced into in some form of enlightenment. And here, that's what she goes through here, right? Like she because before, like it's not like she didn't know that her skin was black. And that the lady that was serving her ice cream was like she didn't know that that skin was white either, right? She understood the obvious, you know, visual differences. But if you need any evidence to, if you if you do not believe that racism um, and like and, and prejudice is a is a taught thing, all you need to do is spend time around like two year olds and three year olds. So it's like go to a day school or go to uh, like a daycare and just spend a day there. Because that is absolutely something that is taught. My daughter uh, is a mixed race child uh, that, that goes to day school with, uh, with black children, white children, completely Asian children, Mexican children, and they, don't, they only care who has the coolest toy, right? Because that is an innocence and that is an honesty, just like, you know, what, what do you, let's play, I don't care. Like they, they on, obviously, they see color, right? Because, that's, because people say, like, oh, I don't see color. You're lying or you're blind, right? Do you see color? Right, but that doesn't inform your opinion of someone, nor it shouldn't. It shouldn't affect your behavior towards them one way or the other, right? And we know that, and that's like in an idealized world. And children live in that idealized world. They do not let the col the, the color of someone's skin affect any attitude towards them whatsoever, unless like they've never seen that person before, or they've never seen a skin color so dark or so light, and then that shade like and they'll go up and they want to. I, I don't know if I told you guys that or not. I lived overseas um, for many years. I lived in Thailand for, I lived in a small village outside of Thailand, uh, well, in Thailand, outside of Bangkok, about three hours from Bangkok, uh, and I used to, I went, I used to box, I boxed my whole life, I kickboxed in Southeast Asia for years, I went and trained in Thailand for a year in a small little village, and I would go, and I would run all throughout, and the, it sucked, you had to run five miles in the morning before you go train, train all day, and then run five miles at night, it was horrible. Um, but I would run out through the rice paddies and through these little jungles, like paths and stuff, and the children all throughout the village would like run after me. Like, like it was kind of cool, like Rocky, and like whenever he's running through the streets of Philadelphia. So I'm not, I'm not Rocky or anything. Uh, and they were inspired by me. They wanted to touch my skin, and uh, and they wanted to touch my. I had really, really long hair and it was super blonde, and it was like down to here because um, never thought I'd ever hear this either. They didn't want it. Like <laughs> I never experienced. They couldn't. They said that they didn't want to cut white people hair because they didn't know how to. And I just thought like <laughs> you know. <laughs> I just kind of showed you guys, like, I just figured white people here was just like, you know, Asian people here. It's like, uh, rose out long and it goes kind of straight. But apparently, they didn't, they didn't want to, they, uh, they were scared to do that. So, they wanted to, like, touch my hair because they thought it was, like, silk and they wanted to touch my skin because they, most of the people that I, that were around had never even seen a white person before. And, um, and so, again, you know, if you, if you take that and, like, I'll, like I, don't, I don't get offended by anything. But, like, I would never in a million years imagine that, that would be an offensive thing. But I knew, like, these children, they're, like, they were, like, touching my, like, pulling at me, like, touching my hair and, like, my beard and all, and all kinds of stuff. And, like, because they were just, like, fascinated by it. There was no malice in that whatsoever, right? So, obviously, you notice the color of someone's skin. You notice their physical differences. 
But if you're coming from a place of like of innocence and childlike curiosity, that means nothing, right? So what happens here is that she is brought forth to her adulthood. She is drugged out of her childhood, and this innocence of like, oh yeah, like the world is, you know, the world is all peace and happiness and ice cream, and we all get along. And then because of this thing that happens, she then walks outside and she sees herself as a black person in a in a white world and notices the difference than she did before. Right? So it's not like she couldn't physically see the difference, but on an emotional level, it registers her. She's like, okay, so maybe, maybe the world's not the way that I thought it was. And that's part of becoming an adult. And that's why she says here, the summer that I left childhood, uh, that summer that I left childhood was white. Right? That's when she leaves her childhood and goes on to adulthood. It's a big part of literature, storytelling, and every person's life. You leave your, the innocence of your childhood, and you start to see the world as it really is. Now, one of the cool things about this, and it ties into... Plato's Allegory of the Cave, we know if you're from her biography that she spends the rest of her life writing about racial inequality, just inequality in general, and fighting for that. So uh, we talked about an Allegory of the Cave whenever you can either lean towards the pain or, uh, or, or shy from it. So here she had this, this, this moment of enlightenment. Um, and instead of sh uh, shielding her eyes from the sun, which is also a source of light, well, instead of shielding her eyes from the sun, we know that she continues on and she embraces the grind or she embraces the pain, she embraces the struggle, one of not only trying to seek enlightenment, but trying to seek enlightenment for other people or force other people to seek or to, to find enlightenment themselves, right? Because the, the person in the allegory of the cave, the slave that is freed, he goes and he has to he has to manually try to free those free those prisoners and know that it doesn't work well for him. But the person that is enlightened is obligated to go back and return to the darkness and free the people from the shadows. And so that's what she spends her whole life doing. So again this is not just on, on the very surface level. Uh, on a very surface level, black family goes to Washington, D.C., gets refused service because they're black. But is that what the story is really about? No. There's a whole other level. I mean, it's about that on the surface, but it's about a whole mess of crap below that, right, that goes, that runs deep. And um, the other part of a narrative that's really powerful, that really works for people, uh, or it can work for people, is that it allows empathy. It allows sympathy and understanding amongst people that don't share either race, culture, religion, and allows you to see people. I mean, that the root of understanding of the person is of trying to sympathize with them, right? Like if you, uh, what did you, if you had like a, a, something wrong happened to you, or you felt slighted in some way, and you were going to complain to your grandpa or your parents or whoever about it, whoever like is that counsel that you seek, and, so, and you felt like an enemy at work or at school or whatever, and you don't know why they hate you or why they're mean to you or why they've got it out for you. You go talk to your grandparents or your parents about it, or your uncle, whatever. You're like, well, you know, like, well, why don't you, why don't you walk a mile in their shoes, right? Because that's the key to understanding one another. You walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, and then like maybe it doesn't excuse what they've done, right? But maybe, maybe you start to see them as a human being. And once you start to see them as a human being, you can kind of understand all, all the things that have happened to that person that bring them to this whatever point it is in their life that you encounter them. And narrative is a beautiful way to do that. By, by telling a story, you allow yourself to be transplanted into that other person's mind, that other person's body, their head, their situation. And it's not that you can relive their experience, obviously, right? You can't, you can't actually relive someone's experience. But you, can, but you can begin to sympathize or empathize or, or have your eyes open or your mind open to another way of life, uh, to somebody else's tragic circumstances that you may not have had you know, the opportunity to, to, to experience before. And all that does is just open up your mind to understanding. And you are much more, it is much, you are much safer in making a judgment after you opened up your mind to understanding another person than before and just judging it from the outside and not, and not even trying to walk a mile in that person's shoes. So, um, if you look at uh, this story real quick, this, this is a student, I mean, I'll, Miss Lord is a very famous author. Um, let me take it down to something even more simple. This student essay on page 154. Here, whenever you write your essay, this is a page and three quarters, page and a half, so obviously you're going to want, want to write more than this, but you can write a good short story in a page and a half, and this is one. You have an introduction. In the introduction, you have your narrative point, which is also your thesis statement. The thesis here, you have a guy uh, that works in a 7-Eleven, and he's been trained in how to talk to people, good customer service, and you know, and he basically says, um, the thesis is that the other night, an old woman shattered my belief that a glib response could smooth over the rough spots of dealing with other human beings. He thought by saying, yes ma'am, no ma'am, thank you, whatever, you could, that's how you interact with people. And there was no real interaction, right? It's all surface level stuff. 
informal topic sentence we see in the first paragraph here. Here in this paragraph, you'll see an informal topic sentence in the, in the middle. You don't always have to have an informal topic sentence at the beginning of a paragraph. You can have it you know, all, all the way to the middle. No later than the middle, though. What is an informal topic sentence? What's a topic sentence? It's a sentence that tells you what the topic is, right? Yeah. Okay. A topic sentence is a sentence that tells you what the topic of each paragraph will be. Now, a true topic sentence is, in this paragraph, we are going to discuss X, Y, and Z. Here, in this paragraph, I'm going to describe, you, describe to you what the woman looks like. You don't want formal topic sentences. You want an informal topic sentence. You don't want to directly tell me what you're going to tell me, right? You want to shade it. So here, the moment she entered... The moment she entered, a sharp contrast to our shiny store with the brightened it up and newly arranged shelves. Okay, so this is the informal topic sentence, right? It's about this woman entering and what a contrast she strikes with the rest of the store. The rest of the store, even though it's a 7-Eleven, somehow it's a 7-Eleven, it's clean, and she is very dirty. And here, she coughs dryly, she wheezes, uh, she was wearing a faded print dress, thin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, she has blue, uh, spot, splotchy blue veined legs. We have good sensory details, she's using Good visual description for her. The informal topic sentence here, uh, he goes up and he, he, he talks to her. And she, she, she has more, there's more sensory dis, uh, de details about her that describes her appearance. He uses dialogue to further enhance the story, to tell her what goes, to, to bring you into the story. And then the conflict is established is that, you know, she wants the food and he doesn't want to give it to her. And he says, you know, like, and so he's thinking, right, like, should I give her food? Or, you know, she didn't have money to pay for it, so should I just give her the food or not? I'm trying to be a good employee. Ultimately, he says no, and then the, the woman feels bad, and she's sad, and then she leaves, and at the conclusion, after she leaves, he, he changes his mind, grabs a can of corn, goes outside to give it to her, and she's no longer there. Now, the conflict that uh, we have, that he has, there's two, it, it only says one conflict, but the conflict that happens at the same time, right? There's an external conflict that leads to internal conflict. The external conflict is that he, as an employee, goes up to this possible customer, this homeless lady, she says, can I have food? And he goes, well... I don't know. That's an external conflict. She causes, because of that, because of her asking him, it causes an internal conflict. And the internal conflict was, should I be a good employee or should I be a good person? That's the internal conflict. External conflict that leads to internal conflict. Ultimately, he chooses to be a good employee instead of, instead of being a good person. And then once later, you know, just a few moments later, he kind of snaps out of it and realizes that he has kind of forsaken his humanity or forgotten his humanity. At, uh, at the you know cost of whatever would happen to this wo woman, he chose to be a good employee. He goes outside, and you know the woman is no longer around. So obviously, it causes him such some grief. And then you know in the future, obviously, he would not do the same thing. It taught him a lesson about himself, and it taught him, taught him a lesson about his loyalties and you know all that stuff. But it's an external conflict that leads to a real internal conflict that most people can really agree or can agree they've had at some point in time. Right? Should I be this? Should I, do the, should I be a good person or should I be a good whatever, right? A good girlfriend or a good employee or a good student or whatever. Or should I be a good person, right? Um, okay, whenever you design your essays, when you write your essays, you're going to be uh, wanting to, uh, to follow, you know, and make sure that you've got these things. You've got sensory details, you've got dialogue, you've got informal topic sentences, you've got conclusions and introductions uh, in your essay. Whenever we come to our class, Next Monday, we're going to go over Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell, and then we're going to get into some writing exercises.